everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Today we are traveling with Rob Williams on a mouth-watering virtual escape through the southern and central regions of Peru, exploring famous sites such as the Manu Road, the Andes, Iquitos, Manu Picchu, and the Empiric Valley, source of the mighty Amazon. This region holds a plethora of specials and endemics from bearded mountaineer to wattled curacao and white cheek contiguous contigu to the cerulean uh, capped mannequin, ancient antarin, and the Andean cock of the rock. George Armistead and myself, Nikki Stewart from Rock Jumper Birding Tours, will be your moderators today, and we love engaging with you. So please send us your questions, comments, or say hi via the Q&A or chat at the bottom of your screen, and we will endeavor to answer as many as we can during or at the end of this webinar. Joining us today is one of Rock Dumper's full-time tour leaders, Rob Williams. Welcome back, Rob. An experienced tropical biologist and birder who specializes in the New World tropics, for the last decade, Rob has lived in South America, firstly in Ecuador and then in Peru, and has guided birding tours on five continents and seen over 5,000 species in the process. Rob has been interested, some might say obsessed, in birds and mammals since he was a child. Fascinated with all aspects of the natural world, he read zoolo zoo zoology and went on to obtain a PhD in conservation ecology, uh, working on long-eared owl population dynamics in Europe. Since 1997, Rob has worked for conservation organizations, including RSPB International, BirdLife International, Wildlife Conservation Society, and Frankfurt Zoological Society and has written four books on birds and birding, as well as many scientific articles. And I know you're working on your fifth book at the moment as well. Welcome, Rob. Take us to Peru. Thank you very much for that introduction, Nikki, and welcome everyone. It's, it's nice to be here again. I wish I could see you all in person, but we'll keep doing these webinars for a bit longer, I guess. Um, so yeah, today I wanna to do a, a take you to central and southern Peru. This is complementary to the previous webinar I gave about northern Peru, um, way back at the end of last year, I think. Um, so um, here's an Andean cock of the rock to start off with. And so here's a nice uh, image of South, Western South America. And in the central mountainous part at the bottom, you've got a large blue lake. That's Lake Titicaca, which is on the Peruvian-Bolivian border. And you can see the Andes of Peru stretching up and away to the left. And then right in the center of the image is the huge Amazon basin. And today we're going to be looking at areas in the sort of flattest area of the western Amazon basin, the central Andes of Peru, and the southern Andes dropping down into the Amazon basin, just just above where Lake Titicaca is, really. So Peru, is, <clears throat> as I've said before, and I will say many times again, is one of the best, if not the best birding country in the world. It's in the top three for species with Brazil and Colombia. Uh, it's got 128 endemics, 126 near endemics. And um, the one thing I really would like to stress about Peru is Brazil and Colombia get many more migrant species. So Peru on any given day probably has more species of bird in it than any other country on earth because it's got more, a higher percentage of resident and breeding species. So it's an awful lot of birds. Um, it's, it's a wonderful country to bird in because of that, because everywhere you go, sort of just move a few miles, you move into a different habitat, a different ecosystem, a uh, different set of birds to look at. So um, just to, to highlight some of the diversity, you can see here some staggering numbers, 108 species of hummingbird, that's basically a third of all the species in the world, um, and 243 flycatchers, you've got to love that, and um, 110 species of raptors, 
186 tanagers, really stunning diversity. Um, today we're going to take a, a series of look at a series of different areas. So on this map, you can see the red area is the classic northern Peru circuit that I gave my previous webinar on. So if you missed that and would like to see it, it is on the web page. So I'm not going to touch on that one today. Um, up to the top left near Iquitos, we're going to have a very quick look at that. This is really a, a tour that it, it goes just before the northern Peru tour and is very complementary to that. Um, looking for those endemics at Iquitos. So I'm going to touch on that one briefly. Then I'm going to come down and talk about the one stretching up from Lima in the central left, the black uh, oval that stretches up to Juarez, and the currently existing tour there. Um, then we're going to pop down, then I'm going to talk about the, the blue circle in that area, which is the central Andes. There isn't currently an itinerary there, but we are working on a remote Peru itinerary that will include that area because there are many fantastic birds that you can only get by going up into that area. Um, then we're going to come down and look at the big, uh, which I put a small circle showing Machu Picchu in as well, um, the Machu Picchu Manu area and the Southern Andes. Um, and we're going to finish off in that area. I put in another blue circle down to the extreme southwest because I believe there's potential for another trip down there or it could be a great area to do a custom tour for those who would like to but I'm not really going to touch on that today. So we're looking at these these areas outlined in black basically today and the blue area in the middle. So the currently available tours for Peru by from Rock Jumper there's um Three in northern Peru, which I talked about on my previous tour. There is now a new itinerary, a, a quick one, which is a sort of hummingbird special of nine days up there as well. Um, today I'm going to talk about the Iquitos Endemics tour slightly. And then we're going to look at the central Andes, the Lima and Ancash extension, which combines actually with the southern Peru, the classic Andes, which I'm going to talk about. There's a post tour extension for that of Machu Picchu. There's also in southern Peru a Hummingbirds and Machu Picchu uh, tour, which is a reduced version of the classic Andes and Manu Road tour. You don't get as far down into the Amazon area. So those, that's what's currently available. Um, but there are potentially, we're looking at a remote tour, which might be the central and southern highlands. We're still working on the itinerary or a central Andes tour or maybe a southern highlands and coast and possibly bringing back a Manu comprehensive tour as well. These are all potential ideas which could also all be done as custom trips. So if anyone really does fancy any of those kind of itineraries, I've just outlined roughly how many days that I would think would be good for these kind of trips. Um, do get in touch with the office and they'll be able to help work something out for you. And you could also do custom trips for a few of the really special endemics that aren't covered on any of these tours like white mast antbird, the three endemics from the Cerros de Sierra remote mountain range in the Amazon, or the yellow-browed toucanet purple back sunbeam area, etc. So we can, the office can sort you out with anything you want really, and there will be more, a bigger offer in the future for Peru. So here we go, let's start off in the Iquitos area. And here's a, a satellite image showing the three main places this tour goes to. It's a 10 day trip um, and it's really designed around getting the specialities. But the great thing about Iquitos is the river that's running through the middle of the image is um, the Amazon. And so you've got forest to the north of the Amazon and forest to the south of the Amazon. And you will see we go up to explore Napo Lodge on the Napa River. Um, which is north of the Amazon, and we go down to Miyuna Lodge, south of the Amazon. And so the Amazon is a biogeographical divide for many bird species. So it gets us the replacement species because we can get both, both sets, basically the north of the Amazon birds and the south of the Amazon birds. And just outside of Iquitos, just 25 kilometers south of the city is the Alpawayo Mishana Reserve, um, which is a very special area of ancient weathered uh, white sands sticking up through um, 
other geology. So you've got these kind of patches of white sand, which has got almost all the nutrients being washed out. So you get a very unique vegetation type on. Some of you who may have been to Me Too in Colombia have seen that kind of um, some kind of place as well and that kind of habitat with some shared birds but this place has a, a bunch of species that were described there so the four birds uh, in in bold the akitos gnatcatcher the mishana terranula alpha wild ant bird and ancient ant wren were all discovered new to science at this place by a guy called pepe alves about well, i guess getting on for 20 years ago now um, and it remains the best place to see them. So we will put in a lot of effort looking for these white sand specialities. And then there are some more wide range white sand uh, or nutrient poor uh, forest specialities. They're very patchy within the Amazon, including the fabulous Pompadour Katinga, etc., that we will look for in this place. Another set of his, uh, I don't have photos of many of these because they're hard to see and I haven't been for a few years since cameras got an awful lot better, but here is a Mishana terranulet, um, which is, is one of those birds. Um, another set of endemism here is the river islands. Uh, and I'm not really gonna go into that today, but the, the river islands in the, the Amazon have a whole bunch of species, hummingbirds, fine tails, et cetera, tanagers, that only occur on those river islands um, in the different vegetational stages. There's about 20 specialized birds out there. Um, and we will look for those as well on this tour. South of the Amazon at Muyuna Lodge has probably got to be the best place in the world to look for wattled curacao. Um, it's the only place I've ever seen this bird. It's a very patchy bird that's been hunted out in many areas, but there's quite a good population there and the lodge is working with the local community and they're protecting the birds. So you get quite a good chance of seeing this absolutely fabulous large crassi. Um, while we're there, we're going to see a lot of other Amazonian birds, birds like white plumed ant bird, one of my absolute favorites that comes to ant swarms and flicks from vertical to vertical with absolutely fantastic plumes on it. And great birds like collared puff bird, um, it seems to be 50% head, so absolutely marvelous bird. Right now, I said that was going to be brief on Iquitos. Now we're going to jump down and we're going to look at this. Um, it's it's advertised as a pre-tour extension, basically, but it can be done on its own right. It's such a good trip. It's a week-long trip from Lima up to the Ancash Highlands. Um, and we visit sort of three main sites. We do the Lima Coast area where we visit some marshland, etc. And we also take a, a short boat trip. In the past, we've done big pelagic trips out to about 40 miles, but there aren't anyone, there's, there was a change in the legislation in Peru of which boats could go how far out to sea. So now we have to do a more coastal trip. It may come that we can do the full pelagics again at some point, but at the moment it's a more coastal trip, but it still offers a lot of good birds. Then we could drive north to a, an area of desert with where the first hills catch this fog that comes in off the cold, uh, Humboldt current and creates a very unique vegetation system, Lomas de la Chai. It's a national reserve. And we bird there for a day before we drive on up into Ancash uh, Highlands and we base ourselves just outside Huascaran National Park. And we, we bird several areas around there, including in the national park, but a variety of habitats, including a dry canyon and things. So um, we start off with a on the coast and a, a short boat trip out around a, an offshore island where we can find many of the Humboldt current specialities. The Humboldt current is the most productive marine current on Earth. Uh, it's about twice as productive as um, the Benguela current and it's got an incredible number of seabirds as a result. So we should see Humboldt penguins, many Peruvian pelicans here, much larger than brown pelican, the southern replacement for brown pelican. Uh, the rare Peruvian diving petrel, even though we can't get that far offshore, we still usually manage to find one or, one or two of these on the, on the trips. Uh, the fantastic red leg cormorant, um, I don't know if you can make out the eye ring, but it has this little broken blue and black banded eye ring as well, which is just bizarre. And many, many guanai cormorants often, the last time we took a trip out there, 
um, we must have had about 40,000 in a flock flying past us. It was absolutely staggering. They were going over us. They were going both sides of the boat. Absolutely marvelous. Um, and this is the, the bird that was named for the guano. So this is where the, the Peruvian coast is where the famous guano islands that so influenced global geopolitical development um, because of the fertilization that it brought to especially the eastern United States and Europe at a, as the soils were depleting. Um, the, the wonderful Inca Turn here, um, quite common along, along the coast here, and we'll get very good views of this. Uh, spectacular turn. They even one of my favorite restaurants to go and eat at. They even sit on the the sort of the awning shelters that go out over the windows because it's right on the coast. And they say you're sitting there just through the glass, the rain could turn the awning strut. Um, and on the rocks, blackish oyster catcher. And the most marine of all passerines, the surf synclodes that lives between the high and low tide mark, dashes down as the waves retreat and eats invertebrates in amongst the seaweed and rock crevices of the rocks and flicks back up, a fantastic bird. Quite, quite dull in plumage, but it's behavior and finding it or, or seeing it in amongst a thousand sea lions, of Peruvian sea lions on the colony, really brilliant bird. Uh, Band-tailed or Belcher's gull, very nice bird here. Quite vented or Elliot storm petrel. Um, they come quite close in shore. There are a couple of other Humboldt current endemic storm petrels, um, which are um, ringed or hornbees and uh, markhams, but they're much harder to get. They're, they're out in the deeper water and until this problem of the pelagic trips is adequately resolved there. I have seen them on these inshore trips once or twice, but it's a bit lucky. But we do quite often get a waved albatross. Um, they'll come a bit closer in. So Then we move to the coast. And as we move north along the coast, we'll stop at a couple of places and look for the, the very rare now Peruvian tern. I only got a few breeding sites where it seems to be persisting. Um, but we've got a couple of good spots to look for this. Uh, the recently split Peruvian pipit, this was considered part of yellowish pipit, but it occurs in the sort of dune slacks with grass just behind the coast here. And Peruvian thickney, quite common along here in sort of rough agricultural areas. And then uh, in the, there's some quite a lot of little wetlands here. And um, one of the, the best birds we'll look for is the many colored rush tyrant here. Uh, absolutely fantastic. It's, it's Spanish name is the seven colors of the reeds. Um, the desert here is, is very arid and we'll find coastal minor and we'll also look for the even more desert liking, absolutely no vegetation at all it perceives to be able to tolerate, the grayish minor. And uh, Lomas de Zachai will, will have a chance for thick build minor, so we could find three minor species in the day. As we drive up to Lomas de Chai, we'll also have a good chance at the pallida subspecies of tawny throated dotterel, which is endemic to the, the arid deserts of Western South America. And we'll look for uh, leaf seed snipe, which occurs in. In, as soon as you get a bit of humidity and you start getting various plants growing on the, the ridges as you go up towards Lomas de la Chai. Here, as soon as you get a bit of vegetation and some flowers, we'll find uh, Oasis Hummingbird. And well, one of the specialities we'll search for is the cactus can to find these cactus clumps and it clambers around in those are really delightful bird often heard before we see it. Um, lovely, lovely bird to find. Then we'll carry on moving up towards um, the Ancash Highlands and we'll stop at a, a lake beside the road as we go up in altitude where we'll find birds like Andean goose, the, the wonderful giant coot, uh, it's 64 centimeters in length, absolutely massive feet, 
it makes a normal coot look pathetic really uh, marvelous and andy and ibis uh split from black-faced ibis now um very different throat structure very different call different ecology much shorter neck shorter legged we'll arrive at our nice hotel in the um just in the shadow of uh, the highest mountain of Peru, uh, Huascaran, and well, then the next day to to work our way up in altitude because we've gone up quite a lot. We'll stay low. We'll visit a nearby area of arid hillsides where we'll look for things like rufous-backed Inca finch, one of the five um, species in the of Inca finch in the genus Inca spisa, which is endemic to Peru. Um, then we may well find many striped canistero. This is the Taxanowski subspecies. Those of you who may have seen it in uh, further north in Ecuador or something will have seen it. It has a little orange throat. It does lacks this big white throat patch. It's a really very different looking and sounds slightly different. Possible future split, I think. Um, then as we move up into the national park, once we've got a, used to the altitude, we'll look for tit like Dacnus. This is the largest and brightest of the subspecies. This is Peter's eye, um, which really is spectacular. This is always a, a fabulous bird to see, but this one with the, the slightly heavier cerulean streaking on it that you get here is, is the best looking of the bunch, in my opinion. Uh, we'll also find the, the recently split or relatively recently split Ancash Tapaculo will be a target. Uh, those of you who may have been with me in in Colombia or even in Peru will know I'm a bit of a um, a bit obsessed with tapaculos, especially this genus Citilopus with uh, I think it's currently 44 species, um, 17 of which can be found in Peru now. So um, this will be one of the ones we'll look for. It's a, got a very small range just around uh, just around the Cordillera Blanca in central Peru. We get to the, the Yanganuco lakes in uh, West Grand National Park. These are absolutely beautiful lakes. Um, it's amazing colored water. And the tit like Dacnis and the Tapaculo will be living in the, the trees and the, the rock fields around these lakes. Um, one of the main target birds for us here, and one of the hardest birds to see, is uh, the white cheek Katinga. This was only named to science in the 1950s um, from the Bosque de Zarate, which gives it its uh, generic name uh, by Maria Kepke. And it's quite a hard bird to find. It's, it's silent or generally silent. It's um, quite inconspicuous. The only good thing it does is when the sun hits, the polylepis forest patches in the morning, it tends to pop up and sit on the top as the sun first hits them, presumably to warm up because it's probably been well below zero up here at night. And so we get up there as the sun reaches over into these deep glacial valleys and hits these patches of forest along the flanks. We we search for this bird sitting up here and it's, it's the place I first managed to find it and it's the most reliable spot I've I've found for it. Um, this is the kind of place where we're going to be in. Those are the, this is looking down. We may not come up this high um, if we find the the Katinga below us, but there is another Polylepis forest patch over the pass behind where I'm taking the photo from. That's uh, the second highest mountain in Peru, Wan Doi, uh, in front of us there, about 5,700 meters altitude. There's the lakes down below at just over 4,000 meters altitude. So. I think this is as high as any um, any rock jumper tour goes anywhere in the world at the moment. Um, but we take our time to work our way up here. The bus has oxygen in it. Um, and last time everyone was okay. Yeah, we could certainly feel it as we walked about. You know, you don't want, you don't want to run anywhere. Um, when I did the recce for this trip, we actually had a flat tire right at the pass. And my friend Will and I had to change the tire and, Using that little jack that's in my hand, it was very hard work jacking up a Toyota Land Cruiser with an inadequate jack at 4,710 meters. But um, it was, you know, it was doable. 
So that was the Ancash Highlands. Now I'm going to talk about the Central Andes. And this is a tour we don't currently offer, but uh, there are plans afoot to, to change that. And I've put on here just a few of the key sites. So you can see it's the Lima Coast, La Chai, and the Ancash Highlands again. Um, the Santa Eulalia Valley, just to the uh, east of Lima, going up into the Andes. Lake Hunin. Um, and then on the east slope of the Andes, the Satipa Road, and then further up above the city of Huanuco, the Bosque de Unchog area. So there are many other sites that will fit in around these, but those are some of the, the main sites I'm going to be mentioning now that I thought I'd better talk about. So one of the ideas for this tour is to, to basically do what I've just described and work our way up into the Ancash Highlands and then back because the Santulalia Valley that takes you up to a similar altitude is a much quicker way up into the Andes, but it's it's harder on the acclimatization, perhaps. So, um, but at the top of the Santulalia Valley is um, some some bogs, high altitude bogs that have a couple of very special species: um, Diadem sandpiper plover, or Diadem plover as it's now generally called. Um, absolutely fantastic tiny little wader, brightly colored. It's amazing, you know, you look at it and think that can't be inconspicuous, but it gets in amongst the, the little peat cuts and the, the grasses and the, the cushion plants that can have those sort of reddish tones to them at times. It can be amazingly difficult to find this bird up there, um, but we usually manage it with, with patience. Um, another marvellous bird up here, and a, a very rare bird, um, white-bellied Synclodes. It's got a very restricted distribution in central Peru. It's enormous. It lives in these um, high-altitude bogs. Many of the most accessible, unfortunately, being mined for peat for the gardens of Lima, um, which means that it's it's destroying the sort of accessible habitat. But there are a couple American bird conservancies currently working to, uh, with a local Peru partner in Peru to try and protect some of these habitats. Um, they, they go around in, in small family groups, um, quite unlike any other Synclodes, a spectacular bird. Um, then as we, we come over into the High Andes, we'll go past many rivers on which we'll see torrent ducks, here a female, I, I just absolutely love the, the plumage of the female. This was a photo taken on my recce trip uh, in the top of the Satipa Road, just within a few meters of us. I can't remember, it's like a 200 millimeter lens or something I was using. It was stunningly tame and approachable. Uh, other, another endemic here, the eye ring thistle tail, again, very small range, only in central Peru. Um, on the top of the Satipo Road and a couple of other sites, really quite a, a small range of fantastic looking bird, quite different from all the other thistletails. That big white iron, very impressive. Uh, Fire-throated metal tail in the same kind of area. Then we get to Lake Hunin. And um, Lake Hunin or Lake Junin uh, is one of the largest Andean lakes in Peru, second only to Titicaca. And uh, it's actually where the, the um, in the introduction, it was mentioned that the Aparimac is the origin of the Amazon. There's a new study that now claims that the origin of the Amazon is a little tributary, just very close to Lake Hunin, uh, that flows into the lake and then out and does a couple of big bends and it, it actually makes it a few kilometers longer so there's a dispute but it's it's amazing you feel like you're absolutely on top of the world um, it gets quite windy in the afternoons up here so you have to get up early in the morning and be right on the lake shore and it, it's cold uh, but absolutely breathtakingly beautiful um, and it's got a couple of very special birds one is the the Hunin rail uh, which sometimes has been considered a subspecies of black rail. Um, having seen three subspecies of black rail, I think this definitely deserves <laughs> to be considered separate. Um, and uh, we try and look for it in the daytime. Uh, and you can usually get a glimpse, but it's pretty, 
be fast. An easier way, though quite cold, is to go out after dinner and try and look for it at night. And they're a lot more approachable at night. Um, and you can get some pretty amazing views like this. Here's, uh, that's a photo of it with my, my friend taking a photo on his phone. And so you can get some staggering views. We, we watched it for about 30 seconds, 45 seconds, then left it in peace. Um, but it, absolutely amazing encounter for those kind of rails like black rail. If I don't know how many of you looked for or failed to see or seen black rail, but it, it's not easy. So this, the, actually there's a different subspecies on the coast of Peru and we've got a chance, I guess, of two tacks on taxa from the black rail complex in one tour. Um, as you go out onto the lake in the, the dawn light, there are Andean gulls flying about. But this is the real target we're going out on a boat trip for. Um, get out early while the water's very calm to look for the Hunin grebe that stays out in the very shallow lake. So it stays out a couple of kilometers from shore where the water's a bit deeper. Um, quite a structural difference. Look at the head shape and the size of the bill um, because you've also got silvery grebe here which um, here's a comparison with the silvery to the right, much smaller bill. Uh, the Hunin grebe is only on Lake Hunin. It's basically flightless and um, it comes to the edge to, to nest, but in areas where there's dense, dense reed masses going out hundreds of meters. So it's virtually impossible to see this bird from the shore. Um, many people claim to have done so. I'm somewhat skeptical of how how well you can actually identify them from the shore because it's amazing when you go out in the boat it's like no 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 oh now we've got to the Hooning Greaves when you're a few kilometers out and so but that's a, a very good endemic um, quite threatened because if there was a single mining uh, pollution incident because there are mines uh, in the surrounding area on some of the streams that go in it could wipe out the entire population. So up here, we should also see Chilean flamingos. And then in the, the scrub around the lake, we'll look for things like black-breasted hill star, which is a, a Peruvian endemic. <clears throat> then we move up to um, <clears throat> the Bosque de Unchog area. This is an area that was found by Louisiana State University expedition in the 70s. And they described a whole bunch of new species um, of bird to science from this area, including the absolutely spectacular golden back mountain tanager. Um, the photo really doesn't do it justice. I'm, I didn't really capture the bright blue head. Um, they're very fast moving, covering large distances um, in this high altitude. It's, it's open grassland with forest patches and they're flying between them and things. Up here, quite common is the Pardusco, a very unusual little brown tanager related bird. Um, the only one in its genus. Uh, the spectacular rufous browed hemispingus here, a, a semi-terrestrial hemispingus, large headed. Very good bird indeed. Um, and so there are several other other birds in that area, including um, uh, Bayventi Katinga, um, etc., that we will also look for. Right now, I'm going to take you down to the Southern Andes. And these are the main sites we're going to talk about here. So the Southern, the classic um, Southern Andes and Manu road tour um, starts in the town of Cusco which is just in the middle of the bottom of the image, just to the left of Walker by Lake. So I should have labeled that. You can actually see uh, a little flattish area, which is, is the city of Cusco. So we start there and we head across to um, the Apurimac Valley, which is um, between the Ampai Highlands and Sore Pampa. And we bird both sides of that, because again, this valley is a biogeographical divide. And so we bird the Ampai Highlands for things like Ampai, Tapaculo, and um, the Spinetail. And we bird the Sore Pampa area for Vilcabamba, Tapaculo, uh, a different brush finch, uh, etc. So we bird various areas around here. That also are good areas for things like Andin Condor. 
Then we go over towards Machu Picchu area, birding Abramalaga, a, a highish pass with some polylepis forest where the birds like Royal Synclodes. And then we head back to Wakapai Lake and then go down the upper Manu Road to the Alto Madre de Dios. And you can see how that transect to the right goes from very arid high Andes down through the cloud forest to the Amazon lowlands. And that's what I'm going to concentrate on now. So here's a picture of Machu Picchu. This is offered as an extension to this tour. It does form a, a core part of the Machu Picchu and Hummingbirds tour. Um, one of the new seven wonders of the world, an absolutely spectacular Inca citadel um, that was lost for centuries and only rediscovered just over a century ago by well, Hiram Bingham. I mean, the local people knew it was there. He was the first, the first sort of explorer to put it on the map. Um, and uh, a fabulous place to visit, just reopened again after being closed for nearly a year. Um, though they did let one Japanese tourist who stayed for, I think, five months, because it, it closed, I think, the day before he was meant to go. And he just waited in Peru for it to open. So they did do a special opening for him because they felt sorry for him. But it is now open to the public again. And tourism is beginning to, to go in Peru. Um, one of the things we'll do is go to a, a, a viewpoint on the edge of the Aparimac Valley where you get some stunning views of Andean condors. Here's a, a young female flying past. This is actually a different viewpoint. I don't have a good photo of the, the viewpoint there, but it's very similar experience. Um, in the high forests here, we'll find birds like stripe-headed ampita. Sorry, that's missing its name. Um, <clears throat> giant hummingbird, uh, quite common in these, these arid canyons. And we'll look for birds like the newly described um, southern subspecies of Kepke screech owl, um, which I suspect will be split as Aparimac screech owl. There's also a pygmy owl down here. Um, in the Aparimac Valley, there's a, a number of special birds to look for. Uh, many Andean swifts flying around over us as we explore these high Andean areas. And then we head off, and this is what I really want to focus on, is, is the Manu area, um, because Machu Picchu is very well sort of documented. On the way to Manu, we'll pass uh, pre-Incan ruins of Nina Marca. So everywhere you go in Peru, there's always archaeological nearby, and you're just constantly seeing interesting things. So we'll stop and have a quicker look at these tombs that are uh about 1300 years old and we're heading for Manu national park and here you can see on the map the the right the of the bottom of Manu national park that red road with all the yellow logos for different things that is the famous Manu road and it takes you down in height from the high Andes into the Amazon lowlands. And it's got to be one of the best birding roads on, on earth. Moon National, this is a view actually from the upper part of the Alto Madre de Dios River back up. Uh, those snow caps aren't the top end of the park. That's actually further to the south of the top of the park. There is no snow in the park. It's not that high. But it shows how quick the Andes are drop away to the Amazon here. And it's that descent that we're going to spend several days working on because it, it's just fantastic as you drop from just over 4,000 meters at the pass down to about 400 meters elevation. Um, so up at the top, <clears throat> you start off with um, Puna habitats with little patches of elfin forest. As with the whole Andes, um, the grasslands have been burnt and managed over the years. So you, you've got um, not very natural ecotones between the forest and the, the grassland in most places. Manu is one of the places with one of the best ones because burning is now controlled, cattle grazing is excluded. So you get quite a good ecotone. It's not yet completely natural, but it, it means that the elfin forest birds are very good to see here. So <clears throat> we'll often start up here in the get up for, for dawn for those who'd like to. We stay nearby 
um, for to watch the sunrise over the Amazon, and it really is is pretty spectacular. It's pretty chilly, but um, as you hear the Andean snipe drumming, and you watch the sun come up over the Amazon basin, and uh, the ant pitters start calling and things, it, it's a, a magical place. So some of the good birds here are birds like yellow scarf tanager, uh, real elf in forest bird speciality, grass green tanager. <clears throat> Um, you big flocks of tanagers, uh, mixed tanager, flower piercer flocks, things like moustache flower piercer with them, etc. Working through the forests up here. Uh, Mast trogon, very common bird. Just And the, the great thing is this road, it's a single track road most of the way down. And it's not very heavily transited. Um, there tend to be little sort of rush hours as traffic that left Cusco at dawn comes through. So for about half an hour, there'll be a few, and then it goes very quiet again. Then there'll be some going the other way. But you can walk down the road and bird from the road, and it gives you great views off straight into the canopy at eye level. Um, so you get views like this great woolly monkey um, just sitting on a branch at eye level looking at us. Um, one of the largest monkeys in one of the largest primates in South America. Uh, Montane solitary eagle, likewise, absolutely eye level, um, right along the roadside. As we drop down in altitude and come into the sort of subtropical zone, what's known as the Yungus in, in this part of South America, we come to a, an area for Andean cock of the rock. And this is the Saturata subspecies of Andean cock of the rock. Um, amazing. Now, actually, it's you can't really see here, but its eyes are actually a very light blue, which it took me years to notice. I always thought they were white, like they're shown in the book, but they're actually a really pale, beautiful blue color. Um, also, we get start getting Amazonian birds. Uh, here's some chestnut fronting macaws, and we get other birds like uh, great potu. Again, an Amazonian bird reaching up into the foothills here. A bit higher up, we can find Andean potu as well. As we come down into the lowlands, we'll find areas with mammal clalics, and we'll spend a little bit of time at these. Often also small parrots come into these uh, clalics in the forest. Here's a, a lowland tapir. Um, we also get wild guinea pigs up in the, the, the cloud forest here. Sorry, some of these slides seem to have jumped slightly out of order, um, uh, which is, is quite a nice thing to see. Lots of orchids here in Oxypogon. I'm not quite sure the species, they're very similar. And uh, Bomaria, so great hummingbird flowers available here as well and quite a good selection of hummingbirds. So yeah, from the Puna and Elfin Forest, um, we drop down through the clouds. And here you can see the clouds rolling up from the Amazon, which is what creates the cloud forest. This is, there you can see the, the Manu Road descending down through Lois. You know, a couple of turns down, we're on the other side, we've got to go down and cross the river. And, and this is the, the fantastic cloud forest it drops through. If we're very lucky, we may see an Andean bear crossing the road or just again sitting at eye level on a trunk. Uh, lots of grey-breasted mountain toucan here. Golden-headed quetzals. The trogon again. And as we, we drop down further, we get a military macaw. Uh, it's not a great photo, but it's it's quite a hard bird to see. And it was they were across the valley in the early morning, and the, the light wasn't great. But it was a, a group of about sixteen crashing around in the canopy of a, a tree. This is an absolutely amazing trip for macaws. We could get um, uh, six species potentially of macaw on this trip. Uh, South Peruvian ampeter. This is one of the recently split from the Rufus ampeter complex. This is the Okobambai. Grillera Okabamba, there was a big split up finally of the Rufus Ampida uh, end of last year. And so this is what the road looks like here, looking at a big old landslide. And you just work your way, views out over the valley and amazing habitat. This is getting down into the sort of habitat where you get cock of the rock now. 
as you open out into the Pilcapata Valley, as we get down to the subtropical zone, lanceolated monklet is one of the possibilities. As is Amazonian umbrella bird here from the, the foothill population. There are a number of birds that are Amazonian lowland birds that have foothill populations here. Uh, there are some great places to look for hummingbirds on the way. There's some hummingbird gardens and the, the lodges we stay at tend to have some feeders and some good planting. So one of the absolute stars is wire-crested thorntail. And then eventually we, we reach the end of the road and you reach um, the Alto Madre de Dios River where it becomes navigable. And this is where you've got the last outlying ridges from the Andean highlands. And these outlying ridges um, have some special birds themselves, things like Kepke's Hermit, uh, which is quite quite regular in um, the grounds or in the trail system near one of the lodges we stay at. And so we'll make a special effort to look for this Peruvian endemic found at various points on these outlying ridges. Uh, Golden-tailed sapphire also in these, these bushes. And from here on, if so, that's where the sent, the classic Southern Peru tour turns round and drives back. Now you only do a little bit on a boat just to get to a lodge, but for a further exploration, I will now take you on down for the hopefully future sort of mano comprehensive kind of trips, um, where you descend by boat down the Alto Madre de Dios River, driving as you go past. You're seeing things like fasciated tiger heron on the the rocks along the river. And this is, becomes a very braided river um, going, you can see we've lost the mountains completely. We're in the Amazonian lowlands now, and you work your way down through these, these channels between these little lines and get down to very comfortable lodges down here in the rainforest. Um, lovely places to stay, uh, good food, uh, good mosquito netting and things. So very comfortable. Uh, look for good good cold beer etc and great birding great trail networks around them and then we turn up into the the Manu River itself and you can see this is a completely different looking river from the Alto Madre de Dios that I just showed the Alto Madre de Dios was coming out of the Andes was quite fast would flood quite a lot this is a lowland river that's been born in mostly in the Amazon lowlands um, although it is still a white water river here um, because it's got quite a high sediment load because some of the stream tributaries are quite high up. Um, but it creates this slow moving river with lovely big beaches in Manu National Park. That's the Manu River uh, where the Pinken River comes into it just opposite. If any of you've ever seen the film uh, Fitzcarraldo, um, which is about a rubber baron who managed to get a boat across the isthmus of Fitzcarraldo into the Manu River and then tapped, it's a true story, the, the, he got, uh, was in a unique position to exploit the entire rubber production of the Madre Rios Basin because of that. Um, the massacre scene where his people massacre a whole bunch of Mashko Piro Indians happened right there. I mean, historically it did happen right at that point um, where those rivers meet. Uh, so, but now it's uh, an absolute wilderness. Um, large numbers of black caiman. This was a species that was hunted virtually out in most of the Amazon for its skin, um, but has is coming back very well. And there's, there's good numbers. This can be the second biggest crocodilian in the world now. Um, it's a very good place to see the threatened Orinoco goose. They breed on the sandbanks or in trees near the sandbanks and hang out on the sandbanks. Here you've got um, the, the two adults and two, two large juveniles. The snags and uh, in the middle of the river and the sandbanks have quite a lot of sand coloured nighthawks sitting on them and often allow very good approaches if you're in a boat. Likewise, there are good breeding sites for other birds like collared lap, collared plover, um, black skimmers, large billed tern, yellow billed tern, and pied lapwing, uh, as shown here. The river is very good for seeing wildlife. Often you'll find something swimming across a lowland tapir, a 
giant anteater. I've seen all sorts of things, white lip peccaries, uh, jaguar. It's out after the Pantanal in Brazil. This is now probably the best place on earth to see jaguar. Um, I reckon if you go in the months of July till sort of October, you've probably got a, a 60, 70% chance of seeing Jaguar on a regular trip and if you put in some, if you particularly want to on a custom trip you could put in a bit more tra and traveling on the river to to increase those chances um black faced black spider monkey again seen from the boat or as you travel along the river in a fruiting tree and one of the things the manu has is it has these amazing oxbow lakes so here you can see the main river and then off to the right is a, a large oxbow lake that's been cut off of the river now for quite a long time. And because the sediment has dropped out of these and they've become quite clear water, and they often have drainage streams coming from the forest in bringing in a lot of nutrients and they're shallow, their average depth's probably two meters um, with deepest points about six meters and a lot of it under 50 centimeters usually. Um, these are probably the most productive ecosystem on earth in terms of biomass because they're amazing solar radiation in it's based on plankton amazing numbers of fish and um, there's a few lakes you can visit and you travel around on catamarans like this which you paddle silently through the the lake and um, you see a lot of great birds um, reeds the on the water side you get lesser kiskadees uh, five species of kingfisher here Horned screamers, absolutely fantastic, often in the vegetated, uh, marshier areas of the lakes. Uh, wattled jacanas, sun bitterns, and this is the lowland subspecies of sun bittern. It, it is actually possible on this to see both subspecies of sun bittern because there's a, a foothill subspecies of sun bittern that you can see on the Manu Road. Um, sun grebe. I'm sorry, I've misspelled that, some grab, but some grebe. Um, black cap donocobius. Uh, Perus jacamar, quite a localized endemic or near endemic. It's also in Brazil, but endemic to this sort of the, the Alta Perus arc, which is um, an area of southern Peru and adjacent Brazil. Um, and a uh, 11 species of heron here including the absolutely fabulous agami heron got to be the best looking heron in the world the smallest heron in the world the zigzag heron quite difficult as usual um, mostly nocturnal but uh, there's a couple of spots to look for it uh, capped heron is quite common also lots of hoats in here in the in the vegetation around these oxbow lakes. As well as the birds, there are some fantastic mammals. Um, my absolute all-time favorite mammal, the giant otter. Uh, grows up to nearly two meters in length, lives in big social groups of up to 16. Um, also near here, you've got, um, this is an area that's a long way from any ocean. So it's a long way from the Atlantic. It's right across the Andes from the Pacific. And so it's got very low salt contents because most, most areas in the world get oceanic spray basically drifts in land and falls as salt, which means fruits and things have a salt content here because it's so far from any ocean, the, the salt content is very, very low in fruits and things. And parrots and macaws come to clay licks. People often thought they used to do this to to counteract their diet of eating too much fruit, like eating an antacid, but it's now been shown it's entirely for salt. And so they dig out here, you can see where they've dug out a particular seam, that will be the, the highest uh, salt concentration will be in that seam. So there's some very ancient soils here that where rivers cut through them, they expose these, um, these seams with higher salt concentrations from when the, there was ocean nearer and the parrots come for these. These are red and green macaws. Here's a red and green macaw flying past a whole bunch of blue-headed parrots. But you can see 10 species in a morning at, at some of these clay licks, and we try and take in one of those. Uh, some other great mammals here, Emperor Tamarin, uh, named after Emperor Wilhelm because of his moustache. 
very localized endemic and there's an emperor tamarin eater it's quite a good area for harp eagles sometimes there's a nest that's known about um and sometimes you just find one walking through the forest um so that's my quick summary of central and southern peru i hope that's about the right time uh so thank you all very much for your attention and i hope to see you in peru soon Brilliant. Thank you so much, Rob. And you might just want to start your video again because I um, I switched your video off just for a little bit while we were um, getting the sound uh, coming through for everybody. Oh, fantastic. That was amazing and so beautiful to see. Thank you so much, Rob. Really, really uh, appreciate everything and um, the, the great adventure that you've taken us on. Um, a quick note before we go into Q and A. Yeah. It says I can't start my video because you've turned it off. Ah, oh, let me see if I can quickly put you back on. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, I will work on that quickly for you in the background. Let's. Let's quickly chat about um, what's in two weeks time, we're venturing back to Europe when uh, rock jumper leader Nigel Redman will showcase the wonders of Georgia and Armenia. Uh, the webinar link uh, can be found in your chat there. Also join Team Rock Jumper for Global Big Day on May the 8th and support BirdLife International's efforts to protect uh, migrate um, migratory birds register in the name of team rock jumper with your name and uh, the link is also there uh, for you uh, then on the 8th of may ebird your sightings share your list with the rock jumper team and if you can support with a donation please do that link is up um, and very lastly, before I hand over to George and Rob and get Rob's uh, camera back on, our GoFundMe donation link is in the chat if you would like to make a donation to our guides and staff and uh, NGO partners. So over, over to you, George, and, and I'll work on getting your camera up, Rob. Excellent. Thanks so much, Nikki, and thank you, Rob. Um, I have still never been to Peru, aside from uh, aside from the airport there in Lima, and uh, you certainly gave us all a lot to think about. Um, you you did mention um, altitude at a number of these places, um, and uh, and you and I had talked about it a little bit before. What what uh, what advice might you have for folks? Uh, in terms of preparing for the altitude at some of these higher uh, elevation places might uh, might you have? Okay, well, <clears throat> all the trips are designed very carefully to work us our way up in altitude. So we don't go straight in um, to a really high altitude place. We start off and build our way up to let people acclimatize. Um, generally speaking, I, you know, there are some places you get to, especially in central Peru, it, the central Peru trip, when it comes, will be a tough trip. It's, it is high, <laughs> the high, you know, but you, so we get out acclimatized. It doesn't mean you can run around up there. You still find you've got to go slow and things. Um, but we work around that. The vehicles all have oxygen in just in case, um, the main thing is to stay hydrated. When I've led a lot of trips, I used to guide people trekking the Inca Trail, etc. And I found everyone who thought they had altitude actually was dehydrated. You know, it was almost wow. always people getting dehydrated. And because you, every time you breathe out, because the partial pressures are different, water is pouring out of your mouth with every breath. And people don't realize how much they've got to drink. And so normally if someone gets a headache and it says, I think I've got altitude sickness, if they drink a liter of water, they'll start feeling better almost instantly. We do have to watch altitude in some of these places. Um, there are medications you can take, Diamox, et cetera. I've never taken any of that. Um, I just, I think that if we do it right and take our time, 
then it really shouldn't be an issue for for anyone. Obviously, if you are particularly worried or you've got a special medical condition, it's good to get medical advice on this. But um, certainly Southern Peru, you know, Cusco, yes, Cusco is is high, but we, we land at the airport, get in the bus and drive down in elevation. And the first hotel for the first two nights down near Lima Tambo is uh, just under 2000 meters elevation. And then we go up in the day to do a bit of birding, a bit above it and drop back down. And then we go up and go a bit higher the next day and drop back down. Then we go over to Oyento Tambo where we're sleepy at uh, 2000 and a bit. I can't remember what exactly. And then we go up again. So we, we work on this by going up and down and keeping an eye on it. And um, George is watching a peregrine. And <laughs> so we, we um, you know, I've never really had big problems. I mean, certainly when I did the recce in central Peru with my friends, we'd all just come from sea level. I wasn't, um, I'd been away from Peru for a bit. They'd just flown in. And by the and we did it really quick because we were just doing a recce. The third day we could certainly feel it when we were up looking for diadem, sandpiper, pullover, and white-bellied synclodes. It was just like go slow, drinking lots of water, and taking time. But on the tour, the way we're planning it, it would take us ten days till we got to that altitude, not two and a half. And so you know, when you're up at, up there, you've got to go slow, but it, it shouldn't be a problem. Gotcha. So yeah, and, and I think that is something folks often worry about is, you know, high elevation is high elevation, but it's not like we're racing around up there. Um, and yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's good to know. Otherwise, um, apart, even apart from the high elevation stuff, uh, maybe you could give folks a little bit of a rundown on the tours we offer in terms of pace. Uh, obviously, some are more high paced, uh, more rigorous, uh, while as others are a little more relaxed. Um, maybe you could break those down for folks a little bit. Okay, yeah. Well, the, the two new Hummingbird tours are the more relaxed version of the classic tour. The classic Southern Andes tour is not a, a very hard tour at all. The walk, there is walking. The longest walk is probably to the Andean Condor viewpoint, which is a couple of kilometers. Um, it's a little bit down to begin with, so that means a little bit up on the way back, but um, it's mostly a sort of contour path going round the mountain, and we have plenty of time to do it in. Um, but a lot of the places are really, it's roadside birding. And so um, we'll bird our way down, but the vehicle's following us. So if anyone does feel it, they can sit in the vehicle for a bit and wait till they see us all getting excited and then jump out and come and see us, um, et cetera. Uh, but it's, it, all the roadside birding we do, we also make sure we walk downhill rather than walk uphill. So it's it's quite a gentle paced tour, that one. The the hummingbirds tour is is and Machu Picchu is a, a slightly easier version of that. Nice. Cool. Well that's great. And um uh, Allison Huff was asking if the Amazonia Lodge is still uh in operation. Yeah. Hi, Alison. Um, yes, the Amazonia Lodge is in operation. I'm not sure if it's opened yet because uh, all these lodges have been closed, obviously, but uh, it has been it has been bought out. Uh, it is it's not run by the same family that ran it before. It's run by another company in Cusco. Um, but yes, it is. It is operation. Nice. That's great. And she mentioned that there's a great canopy tower there where folks can get up high and, and be among the birds in the canopy, yeah. which must Absolutely. be quite the experience. Also, Mike Weaver was asking, well, before we get away from high elevation stuff too much, uh, if you've had much success or, or advice on finding diadem sandpiper plover. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I've seen it quite a few times. Um, I've got a site, um, the, the classic site is at Ticlio, um, which is at the sort of top of the Santu Lalia Valley above Lima. Um, and I found it there. It's, you know, wherever you look for it, you've got to put a bit of time in because it is quite inconspicuous at times. Um, I actually have a site just south of Cusco, a couple of hours south of Cusco. If someone wanted a 
you know a custom itinerary we could put it in on on a southern peru trip as well um that is a reliable site and there's a there's a fairly reliable site for it um near arequipa as well so yeah there's several sites to see it i mean ticlio at the top of the santa Eulalia valley is the absolutely or Marco Pomacocha Ticlio, that bog complex is the, the classic site. Nice. Nice. Well, um, yeah, I, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, Rob, is sort of twofold. Um, your most wanted place to visit in Peru that you haven't been to yet, and most wanted bird uh, for for your Peru list or just most wanted bird in Peru that you've not encountered yet? Okay, well, there's, there's two, yeah, it's the Cerros de Sierra. The, the Cerros de Sierra is this ridge um, parallel with the Andes, it's a climb ridge, but it's separated from the Andes south of the city of Pucallpa. And it's got a, a, an endemic curacao, an endemic barbet, an endemic tanager. And I've never been there yet. I was meant to go last year, but <laughs> I didn't. And it, I really want to go. Um, it's, it's a tough trip. It's, um, you go down by boat and then you go into a little village up a side river. And then you're going to have to do a bit of hiking and probably camping and things. Um, but I really want to go and look for those three endemics. Um, there's another one, which is the white mast ant bird, which is actually in northern Peru. Um, and that's seeable now. And I've just not not been yet. Um, but I really want to go and see the white mast ant bird. And so I guess those are my four main target birds in Peru. Cool. And you mentioned... Um some cool animals um, that can be seen, really amazing stuff. One of the things I was surprised was you mentioned, I think it was the Madre Dios, uh, where you can see good numbers of black caiman. What's, what's, uh, what are people's odds of seeing black caiman and, and how many might folks see in a single day? If, if you go, if we get the Manu Comprehensive Tour going again, um, then black caiman is basically guaranteed. Uh, if we go to one of the Oxbow lakes, <laughs> lakes at, n at dusk and scan with the light, you j it just lights up, all the eyes shining. Um, in the data, a lot of those are very small ones. They only tend to come out of the vegetation at, at night. Um, but you always see some, some good big ones um, on, the, on the lake there. And so, yeah, no, I would say it's 100% uh, guaranteed to see Black Cayman on that trip. Not on the classic Manu road trip. Uh, you don't get low enough um, in elevation. Well, yeah, that's one of my my most wanted things to see is to see see a nice big came in would be very very cool. You can also see it on the Iquitos trip as well. Okay. Um, yeah, it can be seen there. Nice. I have to say that my my reasons for wanting to go to Peru also are are probably a little different than most folks. I have three gull species left in the world that I need, and uh, gray gull and belchers among them. Uh, that'll that'll probably make Adam Riley uh, pretty disgusted. That uh, my main reasons for wanting to go to Peru are a couple seagulls, but uh, but still some well, birds. Lima, Lima Airport, you were within two hundred meters of them, probably. <laughs> yeah, that that and all these storm petrels, uh, these crazy storm petrels, and seeing horn hornbeam storm petrels really. Uh, high on my list as well. well. Hopefully there will be proper pelagics again available soon. The, basically the Peruvian government changed the legislation of the equipment, the, the sort of redundancies in safety equipment that boats have to have to operate miles offshore for tourists. And so it means a sort of 20, 25,000 pound investment from the boat companies that they think is unnecessary it's like triple redundancy on radios and stuff and they're like we're not going to do that it's not worth it for three pelagic trips a year because we're doing they do these inshore trips every day for the sea lions most people go to see the sea lions and stuff and they'll do the birding trip no problem but that that's the problem we've got 
So some red tape. But hopefully someone will set up eventually. Yeah, that would be yeah. that would be really well it's just a question of someone saying, okay, I'll invest the money, but at the moment the demand for pelagics is not big enough to justify the investment. I see. Yeah. Well, that's a little bit of a drag, but yeah, hopefully it'll get sorted out soon. Um wanted to touch on um the uh, cuisine a little bit. And one of the mammals you mentioned was the uh, the cooey, the guinea pig, right? Uh, which I understand parts is quite the delicacy. Um, so I, I, I know some folks that have tried it that said it wasn't bad or they even liked it. And other folks um, that said it wasn't so hot uh, or wasn't just wasn't their cup of tea. Be curious for your take on guinea pig. How often you actually run into it on tour as an option, and the other cuisine because Peruvian cuisine is big, and uh, you know it's really blown up in the United States. You know, sort of pre-pandemic, it was really, it was it seemed like it was really blowing up. Um, and uh, so I think folks would be interested to know if you get a chance to eat some uh, some some good authentic Peruvian food on these trips there will be a lot of chance to eat very good food. Uh, Peruvian cuisine, as you say, is great. Uh, it's been winning all sorts of awards. There are some absolutely fabulous restaurants. Um, on the coast, there's an awful lot of seafood and things. Um, because of the climate, they can grow anything. They can grow, you know, they've got the most varieties of potato in the world, but they can also grow all the tropical fruits. So you've got all these lovely fresh ingredients. And a lot of the places we stay in, a lot of the lodges, especially in the southern Peru tour, because of Cusco is such a tourism area. There's incredible offers and the lodges are really good and stuff. Central Peru, it's a bit more remote and rustic and it's more in a couple of towns, it's what you can get. But um, in southern Peru, the lodges are very good and the hotels and there's an incredible variety of restaurants and cuisine. You can get guinea pig if you want to try it. <laughs> um, guinea pig tends to be very variable. Um, I've, I quite like it and I've had it quite a lot. Um, but I've also had some that has been really badly cooked. It's very greasy and not well done. So it's a question of where you get it. If people want to try it, there's a couple of restaurants that we, we tend to eat out uh, one of the nights in Cusco in a couple of restaurants that will offer a quarter of a guinea pig. So you don't feel that you can have it as a starter. So you don't mm -hmm. think, oh my God, this is my dinner. I've got to eat it. If you don't like it, really, you can have like a leg to try. Um, Not such good. a big and commitment. It's a, it's yeah. Good, yeah. It's a very good sustainable source of protein for the local people because it, they live in the, the place of the houses and they feed them on the food waste. You know, they, the potato peelings, the, the middle of the corn cobs, all that just gets thrown down and a bit of grass and stuff and they eat that. So it takes up no land use and is a really good source of protein for, for the local people. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about that aspect of it, but uh, yeah, well, that sounds cool and interesting. Uh, um, we had another another question as we, it seems like we often get about uh, the trips in the neotropics was about venomous snakes. Uh, I imagine it's quite rare to run into those, but uh, I'm sure some areas are better than others. Um, maybe you could detail that a little bit for folks. Yeah, I mean, almost all the areas we go into, apart from the high Andes, have venomous snakes. Um, there's coral snakes, there's further lances, there's bushmaster. Um, they're all pretty rare. You tend not to see them. I usually reckon maybe one venomous snake a trip that we'll actually see. You tend to see more sort of boa constrictors, Amazon tree boas, things like that, that are non-venomous than you do venomous snakes. Um, you know, it, it, they are there. I advise people walking forest trails, wellies are great. You know, wear well, rubber boots, Wellington boots, um, because it, it stops ticks, it stops horse flies, anything biting your ankles, etc., including most venomous snakes. So. So oh, they're there, but I've, I've certainly, I've never had an issue with any client. Um, I, I've been struck myself once, but I've spent 20 something years living and working in the tropics and it was a dry bite. So, um, 
Nice. Yeah, that's my, your experience in Peru is tremendous. I, my experience in Central South America is, is all outside of that country, but is, is similar to yours. We're quite, uh, it's, it's exciting usually if we get to run into uh, any snake at all. Uh, and uh, so it's, yeah, but it's, it's quite a rare thing. Uh, some nice comments too coming in here. Mary Tate says, absolutely first class, Rob. Thanks for the, uh, the brilliant presentation. And uh, Mary Smith says, really whets my appetite to get back to Peru, thanks. And uh, there was another question folks uh, had, there was um, one couple that were asking, what is the best trip for two pretty spry 77 year olds who'd like to bird the Manu um, and the Highlands? Uh, any suggestions for them? Well, I think the classic Southern Peru is, um, is is the best one if you if you want the real lowlands of manu then you need to wait till the sort of comprehensive manu comes back on um which i'm hoping we can get sooner or rather than later you know i think that's a great trip which goes down into the manu river um the classic southern andes goes down to you're getting most of the amazonian bird species your chances of you're not going to see a giant otter. You're not going to see a jaguar unless you're very lucky, etc. So you're not getting down to that that l real lowland. You're not going to see an agami heron um, on that trip, but um, you'll see a, an awful lot of good tanagers, hummingbirds, uh, a whole bunch of ant birds, um, things like that. Cool. Um, well, I think with that. Um, I don't have much more to add. I, I think we've run through most of the questions. Maybe some of the others will, we may get to later, but I'd like to turn it back to Nikki. Thanks again, Rob, and uh, I'll turn it over to you, Nikki. Oh, thank you. Thanks, everyone. And if we didn't answer your question, please uh, email us on info at rockjumper.com and uh, we'll, we'll get to answering that for you. So from all of us from the Rock Jumper team, Thanks very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers.